there are a bunch of different ways to get at these estimates of inventory completeness. What we've talked about so far is kind of two major classes, the curve fitting based ones and the probabilistic approaches. And um, I think you'll probably be convinced by this point that we want to go with probabilistic approaches. They use more of the information in the matrix, okay? You gotta be aware of the curve fitting approaches just in case you're ever presented with uh, data that don't give you the whole uh, context of the matrix. They just give you that first detection. But really, I think it's pretty clear that everybody's using the, the uh, probabilistic approaches now. So let's, let's explore that just a bit more. Uh, I'm not going to give you a full literature review. Um, there have been a couple of papers that have purport, purported to review um, this field, things like species richness estimators with a literature review of estimator performance and kind of tried to get into this paper and I don't really get it if you do a literature review of performance when each of the different elements of the literature is using different criteria as to what is good performance. So you might want to read this paper. Um, it's, it's at least a, a useful statement of where the literature was. Um, by the way, just so you aren't worried about scribbling everything down right away, all the presentations from the course will be given to you, um, if at all possible, by the end of the week. So don't worry so much about writing everything down. We'll get everything to you. Um, so you can look at this paper. I'm actually going to just give you some examples from an earlier paper. And it's easier for me to give you these examples because I wrote it. Um, I believe it's been my only contribution to this field. Um, and I thought it was particularly fun and particularly um, elegant. So I, I, I still like the paper. Of course, I wrote it, so I'm not very objective. But when I was a little kid, I was the youngest in the family. And every summer, we would do a long road trip, because we lived in the center, central part of the US. And all of my grandparents lived in the Northeast. And keeping a little kid from getting bored is pretty critical on long road trips. And so my older sisters and my, my parents had some tricks. And one of the things that we did was called the license plate game. There are 50 states in the US, a few territories. Sometimes you see license plates from Canada and from Mexico. But literally what we would do is to um, tally up license plates the whole trip. So you're driving along the highway, up oh, there's California, there's New Hampshire. And it really was like sampling a fauna or flora. But there's a difference. I know how many species there are. Right? So when I moved to the University of Kansas in 1993, uh, there was a very magical personality who, who kind of received me and my family there. And we did a road trip with her. And to help entertain our kids, what does she do? But she pulls out the license plate game, which I'd forgotten about. And so in the, in the mid-90s, we were playing the license plate game. And we would do things like, you know, on a trip to Yellowstone National Park, yeah, you go out and see the landscapes that are really incredible. But you also walk the whole parking lot because all of these neat cars from across the whole United States were there. So I actually put this to use in this paper. Essentially, you've got license plates from all 50 states of the United States. And so around Lawrence, Kansas, I went out, it was something like 30, 30 consecutive days, 
And I license, place, license plate watched. And as you might expect, let's see, where's Kansas? Uh, okay, there's Kansas, and there's Missouri. Lawrence is right near the, the border between the two states, so those are the common states, the common license plates. And then you see some like Nebraska or Iowa or Texas that are pretty common. But something like, where's Alaska? There's Alaska. Alaska is pretty rare. I think Hawaii I've only seen once in Lawrence. Um, so essentially what I would do is take along a list of the states, tick them off. It was just like when I used to go out birding, right? But again, here I know how many species are present. So essentially, at this point, it was, this is pretty far back, um, I had seen, um, I had seen Soberon and Jorente's paper on fitting curves, and I had seen some um, early work with, with the probabilistic approaches, and so we just wanted to ask, well, how many, how, how well do these different estimators perform? when we know the truth. And so, essentially, we know the truth, that's that dotted line, the horizontal one, and we can watch how our estimator, which is this solid line, converges on the truth. And obviously, this is going back to Brian's question, Obviously, as we get more and more and more data, we converge on the truth, right? And these measures of, of spread, which are the dotted lines, two different measures, but at least the inner measures also converge. So those error bars are collapsing inward as we give more and more data to the algorithm. And all I want you to see is that there are some estimators that in a very small amount of time are sitting right on the truth line. Okay? And there are others, look at this one, that stay away from the truth for a longer period of time. I forgot to tell you, we did the license plate game in Lawrence, Kansas, and also in Mexico City. This is the inverse of the biodiversity rich tropics, Mexico, Mexico City only has 31 species, whereas Lawrence has 50 species, okay? So this is one situation in which the North has more species than the South. That was a joke. Uh, so look, for example, at this. You remember the exponential curve was that weird one that was always low, and you can see the same effect here. Here's the truth and the exponential estimator is always below it, okay? And so, essentially what we did in this study, this was just a first exploration, but with more and more information, we tracked the degree to which there was bias, which is essentially systematic departure from the truth, but also what we call spread, which is this interquartile range of estimates, so it's essentially the, the difference between the 25th and the 75th percentile of the distribution. It's just a non-parametric measure of variance, okay? So essentially, the perfect estimator snugs right up to the truth right away, even though we have very few samples, and the variance in the estimate should snug down on that line, which is to say you should see very little variance. Does that make sense to everybody? And so this is kind of how things sort out. Here are the Mexico data set, the US data set, the measures of spread, the measures of bias, and giving ourselves three days of data, five days of data, and 10 days of data. And what you can see is basically that there are some real losers they have a lot of bias and a widespread, and there are some relative winners, okay? 
Notice that the scales change, so these guys look pretty good, but these are all kind of in this little corner. Um, and so this was just an exploration to see if, you know, maybe they all do the same. Well, they don't. Um, and essentially, in, in course view, what this points to is that the probabilistic indicators tended to perform better than the, um, the curve-based indicators. Um, that study led us to a couple other things. One, I can show you better over here. This is the, let me, let's imagine we're using this one, which worked pretty well. This is the predicted fauna size. But obviously, our observed is coming up from zero and getting closer and closer to the final fauna size. And one really interesting thing is whether in these early stages when you don't have enough information, whether the method tends to underestimate or overestimate. Okay? Because essentially what you're doing there is you're, if, if both the prediction and the observed come up together, then it's as if your, your predicted final um, fauna gets larger and larger through time. And that, that was deemed kind of unfortunate uh, or undesirable. So, so that was one consideration. Um, and another consideration that we brought into it was the accumulation of information through time. So there were a lot of lessons in that early study. Probably most, most of them are obsolete now. But I just show you this because it was kind of a, a fun study in that we used this crazy data set of license plates, but it taught us some useful lessons. One of the most useful lessons is this idea that I call results-based sampling. And I'd like to kind of throw this at you in the hopes that somebody uh, gets interested in it. It's at least a useful thing to think about, even if you don't use it. So let's think about how we do uh, biodiversity sampling most of the time. Let's say I challenge you to you know, do a survey of a particular province of your country. Let's say it's birds, just to make it easy. So you're going to go to sites across that province, and you're going to sample. Okay? And if you look at biodiversity inventory papers, frequently you'll see things like, we sampled for five days at each site. Or we accumulated 500 trap nights at each site. Or each camp lasted a month. These are measures of effort. These are saying I'm going to, it's along that x-axis, you know, number of samples or number of days or whatever. I'm going to take some piece of that x-axis and dedicate that amount of time, which is to say that amount of effort, to the inventory. So essentially, this is what we're doing. We're saying, you know, here are the five days that I have for each site. And I'm going to take that cutoff. I don't ever even know about the shape of this. I gather these data. I get up to this number of species. And I'm going to cut it off here. And that's my, my final inventory. OK? And I would argue that's a pretty bad idea. You might have two sites. These are just off the web. You know that. A nice open park where you can if we're sampling birds, you can walk up to each tree and walk around it and see every bird in the, in the landscape versus something like this that would just be miserable to walk into. Okay? And in that case, maybe this is that parkland, very easy to walk into. You see most of the species. And after a small amount of effort, you're just cleaning up. One last species, one last species, I'm done. 
But with that other site that was not as pleasant to walk into, maybe your access to the full diversity of habitats is really bad. And so you sample it much less efficiently. Well, if we go in and do just those five days of uh, sampling, we're going to say that this site is this rich and this site is that rich. Sorry. So if we use that effort-based cutoff, this is the species poor site. But it may just be a matter of access. There, we just talked about a lot of things that affect the shape of those accumulation curves. Any one of those or any set of those can cause one curve to accumulate more slowly than the other. Now really what we should be doing is looking for the asymptote or maybe after five days estimating that full fauna size. Okay? But notice that way out and taking into account our the differences in our two communities, the final fauna size may actually be richer in the harder to inventory site. That's not always true. Sometimes the thick vine tangle has nothing in it. My point is not that. My point is using an effort-based cutoff is a bad idea. Much better is to use a results-based cutoff. So what I'm after is let's, instead of standardizing by number of days, number of samples, number of trap nights, let's standardize by completeness. So remember that our probable final sample size, can you move the cameras? Our probable final final size was SEXP, and that was S observed plus F1 squared over F2 times 2, right? Well, we, this leads us really easily to a measure of what, of how complete our observations are. All we want is 